just down the street from our parish, there's an auto repair shop that sometimes puts these, uh, I think, sensible quotes up. Uh, and I can't remember when it was, but uh, a few months ago, they had one that said, uh, character is what you are when no one is looking, when you think no one is looking. Character is what you are when you think no one is looking. And uh, I, I would say that for me, like I would find multiple moments in my life where that has come true, uh, but there's probably only one event where I think I have a picture of uh, both uh, times where uh, I thought no one was looking, and in fact they were. Um, and uh, I used to have a small scooter uh, when I was probably like four years old. Um, it had a long kind of banana seat on it, uh, but I was a fairly obese child, so it was really like a one-and-a-half-seater. Like, so uh, I loved this thing, and uh, my neighbor, Judy, uh, wanted to take a picture of me and my sister on it. My sister is two years, a year and a half years younger than me. Um, we did not get along then. Um, it's taken many years for us to, you know, retract the claws. Um, and uh, we, we took a picture. I'm holding the handlebars, and she's on the back end of the scooter, and we're both smiling. And it was one of these, like, uh, cameras from the 80s where when you took, like, the flash bulb, I mean, it was like it exploded, and, uh, you know, like... All you can see is just like the brilliant white teeth or whatever, and both of us smiling and her on the back. And I don't know how Judy changed the flash that fast, but there's actually two pictures, one of us both on the, the scooter, and then I shoved my butt back and knocked her over, and she slammed her head against the kitchen floor, and there is a second picture of me holding the handlebars, smiling bigger and her in the back, like, sprawled out crying, okay? Character is what you are when you think no one is looking. And that moment is kind of frozen in time. Because for one picture, it makes it look like loving family, loving siblings, such a hallmark moment. And then the other one is actually what is going on. And I think we see both moments in today's gospel, and I think it's important for us to look at it, and I'm very grateful uh, to a friend of mine by the name of God uh, for inspiring me uh, in this homily, which uh, I was inspired with months ago. I was reading this passage, and it struck me uh, this particular insight for the first time. So if you think, oh man, Father Nathan, he's got it going on today. No, I just happen to listen to God every once in a while, and he's got better ideas than I do. So uh, if you're not paying attention to, what, uh, to how the readings are flowing, we're certainly going to end up in a particular uh, vein. We're going to end up uh, kind of talking about this, a certain thing. The first line and the last line, the first line of the first reading, the last line of the gospel are really kind of uh, bookending what is a, a lesson on forgiveness. But what happens when we refuse to forgive? So the first line of uh, the first reading from the book of Sirach, wrath and anger are hateful things, yet the sinner hugs them tight. Wrath and anger are hateful things, yet the sinner hugs them tight. We know this from our own experience. We know that at times we have felt so angry and so vengeful and so filled with wrath that it seems like it's a club in our hands that we wish that we could bash our enemy over the head with to try and convey to them, do you realize how much you have hurt me? Do you realize how much you have hurt the ones that I love? I don't know if I can stand to bear your presence. And it seems to give us a kind of energy but it, in fact, is draining us. The longer we hold on to wrath, revenge, and anger, especially unrighteous anger, the more we are sapped of our energy. And God knows this. And he wants us to actually give our anger over to him. We repeat this line in the course of the Our Father, echoed again from the book of the prof, from the from the book of Sirach. Could anyone nourish anger against another and expect healing from the Lord? This is uh, pointed to very specifically in the Our Father. For we pray, forgive us our trespasses. As we say the Our Father, perhaps we're very mindful of the things that we want to be forgiven of. But are we as mindful of the next statement? 
as we forgive those who trespass against us? Are we willing to forgive others? Because if we're not willing to forgive others, neither will our sins be forgiven. And that's extremely important. Because we might get to heaven one day, brothers and sisters, and think we're going to go before God with our college application. These are all the good things that I've done. Here's my volunteer activities. Here are the good grades. Here's my letters of recommendation. Can you let me into this place? And God is actually examining our hearts, which may actually be filled still with unforgiveness, wrath, discord, feelings of revenge. We want to go before God knowing that he has forgiven us and that we have done the difficult work of forgiving others. We hear this in the, in the final uh, passage from the, the gospel. So my heavenly Father will do to you unless you, each of you forgives your brother from your heart. Wrath and anger are hateful things. So will my heavenly Father do to you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. This is actually part of the Christian life. It's a part that we find really difficult. We love the parts about heaven. We love the, the parts about us being with our friends and our family forever. But living well with each other on this earth is a real challenge. And at times, we don't want to think about it. St. Paul's letter to the Romans speaks of this today. For whether we live, for, we, for if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So then, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Who is this we? This is the Christian community. This is the body of Christ. This is the church. He is speaking not to the world, who at times is incapable of forgiveness, incapable of mercy, incapable of overlooking faults, but not for the Christian community. That's not who we are called to be. St. Paul goes on. We don't hear this in today's uh, second reading. This is uh, chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. If you read on, there's this important line, just three verses later in verse 12. For every one of us will render an account of himself to God. Not just the parts that we like, but perhaps even the parts that we don't like. All of us will render an account of themselves to God. So we have to be prepared because God is examining our hearts to see how have we loved our neighbors? How have we loved our friends, our family, our spouses, our coworkers, our fellow students, and yes, even our enemies? Because today, Peter, the head of the apostles, asks this important question. And if you're not paying attention, brothers and sisters, this is an important question that you need to have answered as well. How many times must I forgive my brother or sister who has done me wrong? How many times do we have people in our life who continue to hurt us? We talked about this last week. We talked about this in terms of fraternal correction. How do you correct somebody who is not living in accord with what they ought to be doing? First you go to them privately, then you take others along, then you tell the church. And then if they keep hurting you, they keep reacting and, and acting the fool, then at that point you treat them as a Gentile or a tax collector. But then Peter asks the important question, but how many times must I forgive them? Even as many as seven times? Seven being a biblical number? Seven being the maximum of the covenant? Seven days of the week? God sevened himself. He is entering into this oath of of covenant faithfulness with us, the Shava, this is seven. Is that as much as the old covenant asks for? Seven times? But remember, Jesus is part of the new covenant. It's not just seven times. It's 77 times. Or in other passages of the gospel, 70 times seven. No matter what it is, it's a new number. We're dealing with a new calculus. And this story, this parable, bears it out quite beautifully. So I want to walk us uh, through it. For today, you know, Peter asks this question. And in response, Jesus tells this parable. 
That is why the kingdom of heaven may be likened to a king who decided to settle accounts with his servants. He's going to bring each one of them in before him. Recall what St. Paul says. Each one of us will have to render an account of himself before God. And the king is settling accounts with his servants, with the persons that were called to be in community with him. And a certain debtor, when he began the accounting, a debtor was brought before him who owed him a huge amount. A huge amount. Now, in the NAB, the translation that is used for the liturgy, it kind of simplifies it because sometimes when we talk about certain actual numbers, they don't make sense for us as modern readers. Like how many, how much is a talent and how much is a denarius? Because this person owed 10,000 talents. So you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, what exactly is that? You know, what's the exchange rate? So I learned, uh, I, had to, I had to do the math myself and wrote it down because, brothers and sisters, if ever you become a public speaker, never try to do math in front of people. It always works out bad. Even last night when I misread one of my numbers and said the wrong thing, so I put it in bold today. So one talent is 6,000 denarius, denarii, okay? One talent is 6,000 denarii. So what is a denarius? A denarius is one day's pay, one day's labor. So you worked, and each day you received your pay. There wasn't a paycheck at the end of the week. The master or the the owner of the property would give you your money upon leaving your job. One talent is 6,000 denariuses, which is one day's pay. So if you think, you know, you can do the math... 10,000 10,000 talents is how many denarii? 60 million, I think. Okay. <laughs> Public school all my life, so, okay? 60 million, okay? And if one day's pay is uh, one denarius, we're talking about 60 million denarius. So how many is that in terms of years? 165,000. 165,000 years of pay. That's how much this person owed. When we say a large amount, we're talking about an amount that there is no way ever this person would be able to pay it off. We are going to render an account of ourselves before God. And we may say to ourselves, I haven't killed anybody, I haven't hurt anybody, I don't owe that much. For every sin, we deserve eternal punishment. And we would have to have an account, we would have to have a negative account in the millions, if not billions So this person is brought before God with a weight, with a debt that he could never take off of himself. And he goes before the king. And the king says, well then, we will settle settle this account since he had no way of paying it back. His master ordered him to be sold along with his wife, his children, and all his property in payment of the debt. Would him being sold, his wife being sold, his children being sold, and all of his land being sold be anywhere near paying off the debt? No. But he's going to make an example of this person. And we might say to ourselves, how could somebody rack up that much debt? Brothers and sisters, it's not normally one sin that takes us down. It's a lifetime of sin. We make certain choices And those choices lead to other choices, which lead to other choices, which lead to habits, which lead to bad habits, which lead to vices, which leads to the kind of character that doesn't care whether or not we are in a state of grace or not. And so you can rack up a lot of debt in a short amount of time. Millions upon millions this person owed. And so everything was going to get sold. They were going to be lost and sold into slavery. But this man goes before the king and says this. The servant fell down 
did him homage and said, be patient with me and I will pay you back. Be patient with me and I will pay you back. Can he pay them back? Can he pay the king back? Is there anything that he can do? Is there a Hebrew powerball? No. There is no way this man can ever pay him back. So is he lying? Maybe. Or maybe he's appealing to the king's heart. Please, I beg of you. I will pay you back. Have mercy on me. And it says the king was moved with compassion and let him go and forgave him the loan. Forgave him. The guy owed 165,000 lifetimes worth of work and, and payment. And he said, it's done. Could you imagine being freed of that kind of weight? Could you imagine having that kind of debt forgiven? You've seen these videos of persons who are in crushing debt. There's no way they can ever get out of it. And someone comes along and pays off everything. What do they do? They dance for joy. They weep. They're so grateful. You and I would be in debt if it weren't for Christ Jesus. You and I would be enslaved if it weren't for Christ Jesus. For we were bought at a price. We were bought with the precious blood of Jesus. We are destined, we were destined for slavery and crushing debt. And instead we're free. Does this man live out of that gratitude? Does this man live from that gift? Does he go and wrap his arms around his wife and his children and live every day different? No. He doesn't live out of gratitude. He doesn't live with an acknowledgement of the mercy of God and the mercy of the king. Where does he go? Where would you go? if you were forgiven that kind of debt. I don't know if we would expect to end up in this same place, but this is the insight, brothers and sisters. Why does he go and find this other man? It says, when the servant had left, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a much smaller amount. He goes looking for a fellow servant who owes him a much smaller amount. Now, we heard a larger amount is 10,000 talents. 10,000 talents. 6,000 denarii for one talent, 60 million denarii. How much does this guy owe? 100 denarii. 100. 60 million, 100. That's not a small amount, okay? Imagine if somebody owed you 100 days wages, wherever they worked. That's not, that's not uh, something that you just kind of forget about. But having been forgiven so much, why does he go to this person? And he says to him, he seized him and started to choke him, demanding pay back what you owe. And falling to his knees, the fellow, servant put, uh, the fellow servant begged him, be patient with me and I will pay you back. Jesus tells this parable using the exact same language that the man used. Be patient with me and I will pay you back. He said that to the king and the king had mercy. Now this man echoes back the exact same words to him. Be patient with me and I will pay you back. Does the man come to his senses? Does he realize that he's choking his fellow servant over a much smaller amount? No. He doesn't care. Because for him, it's about justice. We want mercy, brothers and sisters. Oftentimes we beg for mercy from others. But when it comes to our accounting system... 
in relationships, oftentimes it's about justice. We want them to suffer because we have suffered. They did me wrong, I'm going to do them wrong. They betrayed me, they're going to get what's coming to them. That is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That is the old law. And that wasn't even how the Jews were called to live. That's how people of the old law lived. We are not called to live that way. But we do. We take each other over to court, over the strangest things. We look for ways to actually show the other that they have hurt us. Just like this man. He goes after his fellow servant. Why? Why does he care? Because he's been living in resentment all these years. It was about justice. This person did me wrong. And if they hadn't done me wrong, I would have been able to pay that man back. I want my money so that if I would have just given him a little bit of money, he would have gotten off my back. I had to, I had to, I had to make myself look stupid in front of everybody and beg. And I don't beg. So you, even though you're begging me, I'm not listening. And he throws this man in prison until he should pay back the last penny. Now, did this man come up with the money? It's quite possible. Could he have come up with 100 days' wages? Could he have found 100 of his friends who actually vouched for him, and he took a loan out from them, and then he was able to get out of prison? But this disturbs the entire community. This man is living in the midst of all of his brothers and sisters, working perhaps in the same vineyard, And he has a very horrible attitude. And I know that attitude, brothers and sisters. I know what it's like to hold on to wrath and anger and revenge and discord. Because it makes me feel strong. I know what it's like to look at another person and say, you're the reason why. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be this. How many times have we thought this? How many times have we thought when we look at situations, when we look at persons, we look at things that have happened to us in our past or our present, and we say, you're the reason why I don't believe. You're the reason why I drink. You're the reason why I smoke. You're the reason why I look at porn. You're the reason why I gamble. You're the reason why I can't find a job. You're the reason why I can't find a spouse. You're the reason why I can't find peace. If it wasn't for you, I wouldn't feel angry. I wouldn't feel ashamed. I wouldn't feel understood. I wouldn't feel belittled or afraid or lonely, and I wouldn't feel nothing. We have people in our life who we say, it's your fault. You're the reason why. And why does this man have this amazing experience and go right to that person? Because he hates him. He hates that guy. And he wants to choke him. And he wants to say, you're the reason why, and I want you to go away. I'm done with you. This is disturbing. And this happens within our Christian hearts. And this happens within our Christian communities. And Jesus is pointing right to this throbbing wound and saying, it shall not be so with you. They were deeply disturbed and went to their master and reported the whole affair. His master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant. If we weren't in church, I would tell you exactly in very colorful language what I would like to say to a servant like that. But you know, 60 million and you're quibbling over 100? What is your problem? Why are you like this? What is wrong in your heart? I forgave you your entire debt because you begged me to. Should you not have had pity on your fellow servant as I had pity on you? In the the Hebrew, in the Greek, in the Latin, this word is mercy. Should you not have had mercy on your brother as I have had mercy on you? If we, want to go to a, if we want to settle accounts with each other, brothers and sisters, and do the justice system, you owe me this, you'll pay me back. 
I'll give you a few extra days, but at some point, I want it. Whatever it is, my flesh and blood, my apology, my money, you to suffer, whatever. If we live out of justice, one day, God will turn it back on us and say, you wanted to live from justice then? We're going to live from justice now. You owed me more than you could ever imagine, and I forgave you. Should you not have had mercy as I have had mercy on you? Then in anger, his master handed him over to the torturers until he should pay back the whole debt. So would my heavenly Father do to you, unless each of you forgives your brother from your heart. What does it mean from your heart? That means that it's true, that it's going to exact a cost, that it's going to be sincere, and it's going to take time. God doesn't say you have to forgive them immediately and you have to like it. He just says you have to forgive. There are people in our life, there are situations in our life that we need to actually begin submitting to the merciful heart of Jesus and saying, I don't want to forgive. I don't love this person. I find it hard to imagine a heaven where they are there. I want them to suffer. I want them to experience pain. We have to submit that to the merciful and sacred heart of Jesus. And it's not going to happen immediately. But like an IV drip, we're going to begin pouring the powerful, infinite, saving love of Jesus into that wound. And it can be healed. Sometimes I just have to tell people, are you ready to forgive? And they might say, no. And I might have to ask them, do you want to? And they might say, no. And I have to say to them, can you want to want to? Are you able to move the needle at all? Are you able to ask Jesus, Jesus, I don't even want to. So give me the desire to want to want to. Forgive your brother from your heart. If we forgive from the heart, that place erupts with mercy. Having received mercy, having known that we have been forgiven much, we are able to forgive others. Even great faults. But it will take time. And it cannot be done without the merciful, saving, infinite love of Jesus. If you're just asking, if you're just thinking that Father Nathan is saying, grit your teeth, try to be better, you're foolish. I can't even forgive. But with Jesus, I know I can. And I know that he's asking me to. I want to conclude just um, praying a simple prayer. We pray it uh, perhaps every time we say the rosary. You may know it. It's the prayer that we pray in between the beads. Some people pray it. Uh, it's called the uh, Fatima prayer, the Oh My Jesus. Because what we recognize in there is that Jesus... I know that there are people that are destined for hell. And if it wasn't for you, I might be. And I want all of them to be drawn into your love. And that means all of them. So as we uh, begin to pray this prayer, if you can, just call to mind silently the people who you know have hurt you, have hurt your family, have hurt the church, have hurt their brothers and sisters, have hurt God. As we say together, oh my Jesus, save us from the fires of hell. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Please, I, I can't do math and I can't pray. <laughs> oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins. Save us from the fires of hell. Lead all souls to heaven, especially those who are most in need of thy mercy. Amen. Most sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on us. Amen. Thank you.